So why don't we start so that we can uh, also give our panelists enough time to really uh, talk to the huge issues that they already have to talk about. Um, and so we've, we've had a good lead into this discussion in both of the first panels, because uh, many of us, many of the panelists have actually raised the challenge of how do you evaluate? Uh, we've said we need a better evidence base, we need to get beyond anecdotal evidence, uh, both to persuade donors and supporters to support um, activities in this field, uh, but also, um, and I think as we were reminded in the first panel, um, to learn so that we're not just taking the franchise to different places to be able to figure out what's generalizable and what's not, um, what's best practice. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a big challenge. I think, as Brendan mentioned, we're not even very we're not very good at it in the peace building field generally. Uh, so wh why are we expecting that we're better at it in sports and peace building? Uh, but we do have three panelists here who will uh, address this uh, address this issue. Uh, and I'll just say two things around the challenges um, that I see that I hope at some point we'll get into a discussion. Uh, one is that we've been talking about sports and peace building, and as I've been listening. Uh, to the presentations uh, so far today, uh, sports has been described as a, as a tool for peace building and a tool for many, many different kinds of goals, uh, ranging from uh, promoting friendships and bridges across conflict lines um, to a sort of a tool for psychosocial uh, support uh, for victims of war to uh, keeping youth out of armed groups. There's a huge range of goals, and that really complicates the evaluation question uh, enormously. Um, Besides the fact that there is a timing question, we, we have something around immediate impacts um, that, that several, several of the panelists have talked about, but uh, I think as Brendan also mentioned, it'd be great if in 10 years that we can see some of these impacts. Um, do we have a 10-year timeline? When do we start evaluating? And when do we know when we're having um, impacts? Uh, and finally, uh, there are two levels that I hope we can address during the panel. Um, one is sort of the impact level. Um, as, as we achieve some of these outcomes, it, is sports and are these outcomes the appropriate outcomes in this context? Uh, in some ways, I, in my classes, I say it's the so what question. So what if we do well, so what? Um, what difference will it make? And how do we actually measure that um, and assess that? Uh, but we've also been reminded that um, and in some ways, sports, especially at the micro level, is a very kind of value-free um, activity and it's part of it is what you put into it and how it's done. Uh, and again, um, questions around how do we actually measure and assess how it's done uh, well. Uh, and so I'll, I'll sort of introduce it that way and start. We have three panelists who will be looking at it from a lot of different perspectives, perspectives of practitioners and program designers struggling with doing it in their <coughs> programs uh, to uh, panelists who have done a lot of research and have looked at it from a research perspective. Uh, so we'll start uh, with Michael Schipler. And Michael, um, I think we, we, never, we had never met, but he was the, um, the director of programs for Search for Common Ground in Nepal before coming back to Washington, where he's the senior advisor, uh, senior program advisor for Search for Common Ground. Um, and he's providing support to um, country offices around the world. I think you have 22, is that right? Mm -hmm. 22 on program design, uh, and it has a specialty really in um, sort of youth and children and youth division, which you started at Search for Common Ground. Uh, he is currently, he co-leads a 16-country initiative called The Team that uses sports, television drama, and community-based ba activities to build peace. Uh, so we'll start, and if there's more that I've missed on introducing you, you can fill it in. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and particularly thank you to USIP for organizing this event has been a very interesting day. Um, I was struck earlier as I was listening to the various other presentations by memory of the first time I ever sort of connected the notion of sports and peace building when I was playing Little League Baseball. And my team was playing in 1989. The Berlin Wall had fallen. And my coach had all of us do a little fundraiser and each donate, you know, a baseball bat, a glove, a batting helmet to a team in East Germany. And uh, it just was a memory that came back very strongly about the sort of notion of commonality, this ball that I held that was going to be played with by a kid, you know, from what had been this sort of the other um, and the actual physical contact that that created. Um, so it has been a very interesting thing to see now a, a whole professional universe actually around this. Um, the challenge of talking about evaluation of 
of our work. To me, actually starts uh, long before figuring out our indicators of change. It starts with uh, the question of what we think causes change. So when I was tasked with this, and, and when Sulma has asked me to be part of this, I started asking the question of, well, why sports? Why sports and peace building? What is it that sports give? So for those who are conflict resolution practitioners, and talking about what our theory or theories of change are that guide our initiative. What is it that we think causes change? Why are we doing it? So I've, I've picked a particular element which is metaphor. Uh, sports often provide metaphors for society to understand themselves, right? Even though it might be the same game, basketball or football or soccer or whatever, that's played across different cultures, the metaphors that are imbued in them are different. And they're rooted deeply, profoundly in the narratives of a society that exists. And sports, especially professional sports, but not always, provide society with iconic moments that either cause real shifts in consciousness or reflect shifts in consciousness that are emerging in the broader society. So I wanted to share a few. Who knows who that is? Jackie That's Jackie Robinson. That moment was a moment my father told me about. The moment Jackie Robinson stole home plate. He was one of the very few who stole. He stole it straight on that play, right? And it was a moment that that not only, uh, you know, he, of course, embodied the breaking of the color barrier in Major League Baseball seven years before um, Brown versus the Board of Education. But the moment of stealing base was the moment that validated that color barrier being broken. Zinedine Zidane lifts the World Cup trophy in France. I happened to be there. I was a student traveling through. And when I was, I was there during the tournament before the French won, and I remember sitting and I had this series of three conversations with various French uh, citizens complaining about France's loss for the French. And two weeks later, an Algerian Frenchman raises the World Cup trophy and becomes the most famous Frenchman since Napoleon. And he was actually no voted once in a contest in France as the most popular Frenchman ever. That team at represented in a profound diversity of France and redefined in an instant what that national identity was. Now, they're obviously still struggling, so it's not sort of a transformative event in its totality. But there it was. You can see that every newspaper had Zidane or, or various other players on the cover. Drew Brees wins the Super Bowl last year. Now, what I love about this moment was that Drew Brees gets on television, weeping away, holding his little boy, kissing him on the cheek, right? Redefining in an instant what it means to be a man for American society. Nelson Mandela celebrates the, World, uh, the Rugby World Cup victory. Rugby, which was a traditionally white African sport in South Africa. This was a precursor to the World Cup. Uh, somebody asked the question earlier, what the legacy of the World Cup in South Africa uh, is. It's much more about this realm of the metaphor, I think, than almost anything else. Okay. Abidjan was burning from ethnic and religious divisions in 2006, in early 2006. The World Cup, the African Cup of Nations begins, and what has been referred to as an Olympic truce emerged. The streets of Abidjan quieted down, and the youth who were involved said, well, how can we fight on a day when our team is playing? Today we are all Ivorian. Okay, so this is an initiative that I'm involved in, which is about trying to take advantage of the realm of metaphor that sports provides us. There are, of course, you know, many, many other instances, other spaces uh, where this happens. It happens again and again. Brandy Chastain wins the World Cup of Soccer for Women in 1995, in 1999, here in in uh, in the United States. Um, an Indian and Pakistani form a doubles team, and for the first time in either country. They have players who win uh, a major open tournament in the U.S. Open, right? And they are there together on television. These moments are transformative for society. They're either out ahead of where things are, as the case of Jackie Robinson, who was out ahead of, and, and Major League Baseball was out ahead of the rest of society, right? Or they're reflecting those things. 
That's the realm that we're operating in, whether we're operating at the micro level or the macro level. So I think that the use of sport is really, a, as a peace building tool, is an exercise in metaphor. It provide, we're, our job as peace builders who use sport as a tool, which I really think of it that way, have chosen that tool because we're trying to provide society with metaphors that they can use to process the conflict dynamics that are at play in their own society, to carry particular messages and transformative messages that can cause massive change at a cultural level, a social and cultural level. Um, I think that I've pulled out three objectives that often uh, cut across. They're not, as I listened here today, I realized that these are probably the objectives of how we use sports as, as a peace building tool in Church for Common Ground, rather than how they're used uh, you know, by, by a lot of other groups, because I, I think one of the things I realize is that the tool manifests very differently and very diversely all in, you know, with all the different tools that people have. So UNICEF is looking at it from a children's well-being in a holistic way, while others might be looking at it from a relationship level. But I pulled out three objectives, three parts of the design. The first is that it provides forum for people to convene across dividing lines towards shared goals. Okay. The second is that it transforms people's identities so that they can relate to each other and themselves in multiple ways. Uh, Brandon talked about relating to each other as human beings, but I think that the, the part of identity that this is very profound in is that it enables people to conceive of themselves as multifaceted people, and it reduces the ability for people to be easily manipulated around ethnic, political, other lines. Uh, and a third is to create metaphors of cooperation and shared identities that go into the cultural realm of society. And that's what this initiative is really primarily focused on. Um, I'll tell you two, three very quick anecdotes. How am I doing for time here? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, let me tell you three very quick anecdotes and then uh, show you a very quick video and then talk a little bit about how we measure the changes here. Uh, the first is an anecdote about Nepal. It's 2006. May, there's a ceasefire, and the war is looking like it might come to an end between the Maoists and the government military. Uh, both armies uh, have at least put their weapons to the side for the moment, and they're trying to figure out really what to do as there's a sort of a stalemate and the negotiate peace process and negotiation is emerging. And the Maoists were beginning to come out of the forest, as they would say. And there was a youth group in a province called, uh, in a district called Kailali. And this youth group was made up of young people from across all sorts of dividing lines. They're trying to figure out what can we do to support this big, you know, peace process that's happening in the capital or in this little village. So they figured out that they could organize a volleyball tournament. They brought together a number of teams, a bunch of youth clubs from the area, the political parties that were all at odds with each other, the army, and the People's Liberation Army, which was the Maoist army. Each had a team represented. And they played. And the young leader who had convened this stood up and he said in front of the whole community, on this ground where we fought our war, we are now fighting for peace. So it was not just a convening space. He turned it into a symbolic, metaphorical space where people could normalize relationships with each other. And they played, and they just played against each other. The PLA guys came with these blue shirts, you know, PLA on the back with numbers, you know, different uniform from the ones they wore on a daily basis. Second story. Anecdote is from Burundi, where two, the leadership of two militias met uh, by happenstance uh, at, uh oh, I'm not doing that well on time. <laughs> they met by happenstance uh, at a uh, at Search for Common Ground and decided that they were going to organize football tournaments to reduce the manipulation of youth to violence. And what they decided to do was to actually uh, organize these tournaments with the teams that were mixed so that Hutus would come to the defense of Tutsis and Tutsi would come to the defense of Hutus on the football pitch. The third thing I wanted to share with you, and then I'll say a very quick word, is uh, on the, the team, just to sh give you a sense of what it is that we're, we're doing. This is one minute long. Speed, speed, Abbas. Work on your speed. Remember that this is a training camp. You've got only one purpose, and that is to win. I didn't hear from Kadir Kora. I'm under the impression that he's going to win. Umar, Maqiti. Samir, what's the matter? Stop it! 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 Stop it
No, will you play together or would you rather stick to your own kind and play separately? Let's go there and win! Good! <laughs> If we all focus on being different tribes, what makes us care about? country we have 16 under contract now um, around the world which is locally written that takes that metaphor of the the central metaphor of the cooperation is what allows you to score goals but adapts it and roots it in local narratives and local realities so they wrote in, written entirely by production company uh, production companies on the ground we don't write the shows ourselves we, we work with professional television producers to make the show but it's a franchise essentially okay so my last thing I want to say is a measuring change. We have three R's. That's sort of our kitschy way of organizing it to understand what it is that we're trying to achieve. The first R is reach, okay, which has to do with who is actually receiving the messages from our sports and peace building initiative, right? And there are two elements to that. The first is how many people are seeing the show, for instance, in this case. How many people are getting that metaphor to reach their, their, you know, their ears and their eyes, right? The second element of reach is about who. We call it in, you know, the strategic who, to, to take CDA's language, which is about who are those people who are most crucial to transforming conflict dynamics on the ground in conflicts and who need to see the show. So if we focus in the program, for instance, on land reform, are we making sure that landowners and landless people are both seeing the show and maybe in a way that actually enable them to uh, work to actually see it together? Okay. But that's still at that output level, basically. That's just the first layer. The second is uh, resonance. Okay, this is the whole thing about transference. Are people who are viewers or participants in the programs able to take the messaging, the skills that they're learning, whatever it is that they're getting from that peace building initiative, and transfer it into their real lives? Can they take that storyline and say, hmm, these guys built, or, or these women built a relationship. We have a number of shows that are about women's teams. And these women have built a relationship across dividing lines. Can we actually do that in other realms of our life? And the third, third is about response, which is about what do people do? What actions do people take on their own, with their own resources, to achieve uh, changes in their society in ways that build relationships across those dividing lines? So I'll leave it there, and uh, we can discuss further during the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. You raise a couple of very good issues, adding to the sort of sports goals and, and, and the complications of evaluation that sometimes, it's a, as we've said, it's a public activity. Um, and so evaluating, you're evaluating much beyond the participants in your programs and how do you do that. So that's adding, adding another layer of compl complication, but also providing a good framework for starting to think about that. And so I will uh, turn to Peter. Uh, who is the, currently the director of the Center for Sport Policy Studies and a professor in the Faculty of Physical Education at Health at the University of Toronto. Uh, he's been, he's a prolific author, as I can see, um, has written a number, his research interests are, include sport politics and policy issues. Uh, he's written a number of books, um, some of which my 13-year-old daughter have, has read because she's been interested in the subject, uh, and is also the former editor of the Sociology of Sport Journal and the International Review for the Sociology of uh, Sport. Uh, and he has developed, is co-developed, I guess, one of the first university courses on international development uh, through court, sport, so has pulled, to, pulled this together for an academic uh, audience in a systematic way. And so we'll be talking, I think, about evaluation methodology. Thank you. Um, it seems that peace is in the air these days. Uh, I sent a doctoral student to Belgium last week for a sport and peace uh, conference, and uh, 
Dalai Lama was in uh, Toronto at the weekend and uh, and gave a speech in a huge football stadium uh, called Human Approaches to World Peace. And his message was, peace will not drop from the sky. Uh, so uh, this this is about peace building and uh, and uh, and the place of sport in peace building. Um, and we seem to continually uh, find ourselves at loggerheads in this area between the, uh, the young idealists uh, uh, who are running programs and who have all kinds of heartwarming stories and the skeptical, hard-nosed academics, uh, uh, among which I count myself, uh, uh, who, uh, who look uh, uh, long and hard at this stuff and say, is it too good to be true? And it probably is. Um, so, so where I come from in this, uh, I don't want anything that I say today to be taken, take, to take away from the fact that I think this, this new wave of, uh, of uh, idealistic young people and altruism around uh, sport and development um, is, is a problem. I think we've, we've had a, a whole generation of uh, selfish and egotistical uh, sports people, and we need... Uh, you know, a revival of, uh, of, uh, of a politicized uh, sports people who are prepared to engage in, uh, in issues and try to change the world. And, and I see my work, or part of my work at the University of Toronto is, is, to, uh, is to figure out how to do this properly. So the critique is intended to be constructive critique. I think what we find here is that uh, that people who are good at sports, who uh, who are really enthusiastic about sports, assume that they are everything that they are because of their participation in sports, and they want to pass that on to everybody. And they continually forget that most people's experience of sports is that uh, they got cut from the team, they hated gym, you know. They, uh, you know, I mean that that most people's experiences are not that. So, uh, so you know, their idealism is 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 really important, but they do tend to become sport evangelists, and though that evangelism tends not to see anything negative uh, and tends just to, to promote the positive. Um, intuitively, sport is not an ideal vehicle for peace building uh, because of that exclusivity that people have, have experienced, you know, that people have been cut from sports, people have been told they're not good enough, people have not developed skills. They've been marginalized in their physical education classes. Uh, it, in all kinds of ways, people are, you know, in that sense, it's not, it's not ideal. In another sense, it's, it's, it's built on combat combative language. Um, you know, uh, we, sport is, is, we use war talk all the time in, in sport. Um, and, and so pitting teams against each other, pitting athletes against each other, Again, becomes problematic when when we're uh, when we're talking about sports. And probably what's happened is that people tend to essentialize sport. They tend to talk about sport in general rather than talking about all of the different things that sports can do. So sport has been used to sustain and support communism, socialism, capitalism, and fascism. Sport has been used to uh, prepare combat forces and to build, uh, build peace. So sport in itself, and has, as has been mentioned, is, is not normalized in any particular direction. It's the particular construction that we make of sport that has possibilities for peace building here. The people who have done sport for peace research and who have run sport for peace projects seem to be completely disconnected from a huge theoretical body of work on peace building and, and research in other areas on peace building. So for example, Johan Galtung is probably the dean of, uh, of peace building theorists. Um, he's actually written two articles on sport that I've never seen cited by, uh, by peace building uh, uh, agencies or, or even scholars. Lederach's work on, uh, on 
of building net webs of net and networks um, and social spaces for peace building um, is ideal for, uh, for sport. And a number of Sport for Peace projects intuitively have done that without recognizing that there's a body of theory behind it. And, and Schick's work on uh, ritual approaches to identity transformation and, uh, and peace building is ideal because sport is full of rituals and, and the possibilities are there for rituals. But again, this, this has been disconnected from, from people in the, uh, in the sport and peace building area. One scholar in the field who has actually run two different uh, Sport for Peace projects, one in Northern Ireland and one in, in Israel, uh, is John Sugden. And he said that if projects are locally grounded, carefully thought out, and professionally managed, they can make a modest contribution to wider efforts to promote conflict resolution and peaceful coexistence. So his experience is to make very modest claims about sport. That it needs particular conditions, but sport itself isn't going to change the world. Uh, and and he, he's an idealist in many ways, ways but also a realist scholar in, in this sense. So what we've had is a black box model of sport, um, what I call um, add sport and stir. Uh, you know, you, you, you know <laughs> this, uh, you put sport in at one end and good things come out at the other end and we really don't know how that happens. Um, and what we need is very clear sense of what's going on. We need to understand, we need a logic model. Why will sport make a difference? How will it make a difference? What's our starting point? What do we expect to be our ending point? And can we possibly measure that as an ending point? So I think we do need that kind of a, a logic model. Um, I think we've probably got a problem where sport has been, a, um, NGOs have seen uh, um, volunteer efforts in this area as a finishing school for our uh, Western uh, volunteers. And almost all of them come back and say, uh, I got much more out of it than, than I gave. And, and I think we need to set that balance up a lot more straight, uh, you know, so that we're not using international uh, projects as, as a finishing school for our students. So uh, what do we know? From the larger peace building literature and the sport literature, we know that uh, gender inclusive programming is important, but it needs to be handled carefully. Sport is dynamite in this area. You know, I, I talked about you know the sport being exclusive, but uh, and uh, and having combative uh, combative language, but it really does need to be handled carefully. So I know of some projects that have been uh, gender inclusive where you know, the project leaves town and, uh, and the girls get beaten up uh, for stepping out of traditional, uh, traditional uh, uh, places in, in, their, in their cultures. And I think that's where we need really careful management, understanding, cultural sensitivity, before we go in and, and impose uh, uh, Western ways on, on, on international projects. So gender inclusion, the importance of professional trained and committed volunteers. Um, volunteers tend to be there for the short term. They tend to be uh, 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 culturally unsophisticated, and, and they really do need to be trained. They tend to be impatient. They expect to see results in four weeks or, or six weeks. Um, uh, one, one example, we interviewed a... Uh, <laughs> This, is, this might be stepping on some toes in this room. Uh, we interviewed a former uh, volunteer from, uh, from a Northern Ireland basketball project. Uh, and, uh, and she said, uh, you know, that the, the kids were playing together, but she couldn't understand. She was very frustrated with the fact that all the Catholic teachers and parents stood on one side of the gym and all the Protestant teachers and parents stood on the other side of the gym. And I'm thinking, you know, the real issue here is that the kids were playing together and they were being supported in that by people from, uh, from separate communities. And we shouldn't care that, that they weren't getting together. They wanted the next generation to get together and they were, they were supporting that. So, so uh, it, it needs to be, uh, volunteers need to be really carefully trained in these ways, I think. We need to figure out ways of constructing sport for peace. And there are good coaching manuals, 
um, good, uh, good volunteer training manuals that are out there where people have slowly begun to figure out if you do sport this way, it's going to be a big problem. If you do sport this way, we can actually achieve something. And it's going to vary from place to place. Uh, we need to employ a community-based approach. We need programs that are uh, accessible in every possible way. Um, we need to care for participants. And Jake Oakley and I um, have suggested that uh, sport can have a really powerful impact, as well as other things can have a really powerful impact. If the participants feel physically safe, personally valued, socially connected, morally and economically supported, personally and politically empowered, and hopeful about the future. And if you can create those circumstances in a program, you will see really good things happen. So, uh, so that's sport can only be part of a whole series of endeavors. And this makes it really problematic for evaluation. So if you've got a whole series of uh, peace building initiatives that are going on in, in a community or in a country, how do you disentangle sport from education, from the theater program, from the music uh, exchange, from all of the other things that are going on for peace building. And can you measure that? And nobody's suggesting that we set up a social experiment where one group only gets sport and one group only gets uh, education. You know, uh, you know I, I don't think we should do that. But then we shouldn't be claiming so much for sport individually when it's usually working in combination with other things. The, field, uh, the sports field is a classroom. There are all kinds of teachable moments that come out uh, from sports, and we have to be able to uh, be trained enough to be able to use those teachable moments. And if we're using external agencies, we really have to, uh, we really have to be concerned about the short-term parachute-in, parachute-out uh, volunteers that are very often the heart of, heart of these uh, projects, and, uh, and certainly the celebrity athletes, you know, who may be quite meaningless celebrities in, in another country, but they're there for, as part of the fundraising in the home country. Um, so this is a difficult area. There are some quite good projects out there. Open Fund Football Schools is, uh, is an interesting one in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, uh, it's a Danish-run uh, NGO, and they really connect with local people. Uh, teachers and parents are very much part of the project organizing, and the kids during the summer holidays play on mixed teams. It seems to be working okay, um, and and it's interesting because uh, it's probable that the uh, one of the major triggers for the Yugoslav uh, uh, civil war was uh, was uh, Serbian uh, soccer hooligans. Uh, and, and at a game. So, you know, to have open fund football schools to attempting to rebuild peace, certainly the, the indications are that that, that may be working. Um, so, just the last word of caution on transference. Um, we, we see happy faces, we hear all kinds of short term endorsements, but, you know, what is the long term outcome of these projects? And the key here is the kids have to go home at the end of the day. They have to go back into their communities. They have to, uh, they have to go back into prejudiced communities, problematic communities, uh, communities that haven't reconciled anything. And, and so, you know, can a short-term sport project really make a difference? Well, possibly if we're patient. And, and I think, you know, we're, we're impatient uh, in the West about achieving results. Thank you. More food for thought and challenge. Um, and so let me introduce Sarah Hilliard, uh, last but certainly not least. Um, Sarah, you uh, is going to be, I think starting in January, January. Yes. Um, begin a postdoctoral fellowship at Georgetown in the conflict resolution program. Uh, she earned her PhD from the University of Tennessee in sport and education exercise science with a concentration in sports psychology and has actually been a practitioner and has done a lot of this work um, in the past, so speaks from both a research and a practitioner uh, perspective. I call that identity disorder. <laughs> Let me uh, fix this quickly. 
And uh, Peter, you left me with quite a challenge to finish this um, because I am the young, excited, ignorant, crazy, <laughs> right? The one that he talked about at first, like, oh, those young spries, you know, they're just really jumping into it, wanting to make a difference. And, and that is me, um, who has somehow managed to retain that, but also step my foot into Peter's world, academia. And the way that they came about, um, actually, I feel like we're no longer speaking with you all. I feel like Peter and I are now having a conversation. So, because there were lots of things that, that I would love to respond to, but hopefully we can all, all gain something from it. Um, this idea in my, my PhD in concentration in sports sociology, but this idea that sport in and of itself isn't what fixes things, right? It's what we choose to do with sport. And I think that's anything in life. And so my experiences, I was one of those children who my parents felt like it was really important to put me in sports because we learned so many great lessons, right? We take that for granted that just because you stick a kid in sports, somehow they're going to come out as great leaders, great communicators. They're going to cooperate with people. They're going to trust all of those things. And I tell my students in my sports sociology class, if you stick Jay Leno in a garage, is he going to turn into a car? <laughs> No, he's not. So the assumption that if we drop our kids off at soccer practice and put them in a soccer league or a basketball league, that somehow they're going to turn out to be the next president of the United States or the next leader or CEO of a company just because we've planted them in this space isn't true. And this really came to life for me. Um, played sports all through uh, a young age, through high school. And then I went to university on a basketball scholarship. And it was at that point in my life that I was confronted with this idea that sport is really not all that great. In fact, it sucked, <laughs> right? So as a student athlete, I am now, I became property of a university that had goals that were much beyond what my own goals in sport were. Right? So I was socially, physically, educationally exploit exploited as a student athlete. And to be quite honest, it was the most miserable four years of my entire life. When I graduated and walked across the stage with a sport management degree, the question was, I now have a degree in sport in which I want nothing to do with the rest of my life. I was so impacted by my experiences that I literally was at this breaking point of, do I ever want to be involved in sport again, or do I want to walk away from it forever? But I felt connected because now I have this degree, I have to do something with it. And so I can appreciate your critiques of sport, and I think it was at that moment when I really had to decide, am I walking away from it, or will I continue to embrace sport? And my decision was to embrace sport but I was bound and determined to use sport to do something positive in people's lives. And so it was shortly after that that I created an organization called Sport for Peace. And through those experiences, we worked quite a bit in China doing friendship tours, creating dialogue, all these wonderful things that we've all talked about, dialogue, um, getting to know each other, building relationships. And sport became the common denominator for us in which to do that and to carry that out. Um, after about 14 projects in China, uh, we began receiving requests from the Middle East, specifically Iran. And Iran was very interested in, in building up their women's sports programs. And I'll, I'll never forget, I was, uh, I was working on a master's degree in sports psychology at the time. I was coaching a uh, softball, a, a softball at a really small university in Kentucky, and I received a phone call, and on the other end was uh, broken English with a Persian accent, and it said, are you Sarah Hillier? And I said, yes. Uh, can you please come to the Islamic Republic of Iran? We want to learn softball. <laughs> so, you know, I sat up in my chair, and uh, you know, I'm like, what, what is happening? Like, am I, am I okay? Uh, Excuse me, can you repeat that? Yes, uh, we are from the Islamic Federation of Women's Sports. We want you to come to Iran. Please accept our invitation and teach the women softball. Okay, so, you know, this was really confusing for me. Uh, first of all, I knew that softball was on the chopping block as an Olympic sport, so why pursue softball? 
Secondly, um, why softball? <laughs> and thirdly, why softball, <laughs> right? Like in Iran, why softball? So I accepted the invitation and traveled to Iran uh, in 1999 for the first time. Um, we have traveled on numerous occasions. We've done nine um, projects for developing sport, specifically softball, I don't know, uh, in Iran. Um, but really that became the tool, as I'll continue to use the language that we've been using, but the tool for creating dialogue between American women and Iranian women, which is almost unheard of, right? It's not like Iranian and American women are going to get together at the peace talks or in any other diplomatic venue. There's few exchanges between Americans and Iranians, especially on Iranian soil to begin with. So maybe there's some undercover business deals going on or, you know, some things like that. But as far as women engaging women, sport became a tremendous tool. And it was during that time that, um, that we really began to explore this idea of sport and, and peace building from that perspective. So here's the problem. The organization that I founded that I told you about, Sport for Peace, yeah, there's three of us who are um, involved in that organization. That's me, myself, and I, right? So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm the only one. I'm not even full-time. Uh, I've done any number of other things because funding organizations is very difficult. I had other pursuits. So this has always sort of been like my side job that's really a full-time job, but I've never been financed or, you know, compensated through that. So our organization uses volunteers solely. And so I can echo your all's uh, earlier panelists and Peter, the importance of training great volunteers because you don't want to just plant them into something. So eventually, as we look at donors and, and continuing to support our work in Iran, money becomes a necessity, unfortunately, for all of us. And of course, what do donors want? They want statistics, right? They want measurement. They want evaluation. So me, myself, and I had a conversation as a staff, and we decided that we can't afford to bring in an expert. First of all, I couldn't get a visa for an expert researcher to come with me to Iran because visas are very hard to come by. So as the Iranians would invite us, I couldn't get extra visas for researchers or media or, or any other person. So I was confronted with, okay, if measurement and evaluation is important at this stage of our organization and our outreach to the Middle East, something has to be done. So I did what any athlete would do. I just did it. If research is important, I have to go back and get my PhD. So I did it. So that way I could remain a practitioner. I could bring with me um, the expertise of research. Now that also creates several complications, right? I'm biased. It's my program. I think it works, right? <laughs> oh yeah, it's great. Look at our evaluations, <laughs> right? Yeah, we're going to change the world, me, myself, and I. We got this. So, so these challenges exist and um, even as far as my research in Iran and doing that for my dissertation, there were also a lot of issues. The issue of other and Westerner and the colonialization and all of those things that we think about um, in certain political and, and cultural contexts as researchers coming in to research things within certain contexts also poses a lot of other problems. And so uh, my research, as far as the dissertation then, moved to an autoethnography because then it wasn't me writing about other, it was me writing about how those, those experiences and seeing the relationships through sport and the, the peaceful and the pursuit of dialogue and those types of things, how those have impacted me. Now that's very limiting for a donor to say, oh, that's great, Sarah, that that changed you, but why should I, why should I support this? And so um, definitely as we continue to move forward in measurement and evaluation, there are tremendous challenges that lie in front of us. And I am so excited and want to thank the U.S. Institute of Peace. I want to thank Georgetown University. I want to thank the Generations for Peace, Sport and Peace Building Postdoctoral Fellowship because I think we're reaching a moment, right? We've been doing this for a number of years. Peace players, you've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing this for 15 years. We've got our hands in it for 10 or 15 years, but it's like we're the spunky people going out and doing the thing, and now we're realizing, oh, my gosh, like, look at where we are. Now we have to provide evidence base, right, proof that this works. And how are we going to do that? Um, so I'm very appreciative for this opportunity. And in my role at Georgetown, um, my goal will be 
to bring all of the grassroots organizations, all of the experts, academics, even the critical ones, <laughs> to the table to explore this idea of, in, in when it comes to designing our programs, what are excellent practices? Not best practices, but what are great practices as we design our programs and draw upon one another's expertise? In implementing those programs, how do we do that? What are the best practices in implementing those programs? And then obviously this panel is about measurement and evaluation. So not only getting the brains together of those people who've been on the field carrying this out and finding out what's working for you in measurement and evaluation, but also bringing in other conversations of people in development and other areas who have sort of gone ahead of us in the, in the idea of measurement and evaluation. And so really at the end of the day, really at the end of the year, literally, um, of this postdoctoral fellowship, the idea is to create a toolkit, a resource, something that can be shared. Because this is what dawned on me, and I, th I think this is fascinating. We are about peace, right? We use sport to promote, to encourage, to bring about peace. But the irony and the paradox is, as peace organizations, we don't want to share, right? Because we are, quote unquote, we say this all the time, fighting for resources, right? But we're about peace. I will so take you down if you're going to get my money, right? No. Because our program, so it's this idea of how are we going to come together as practitioners, as experts in this field, and see beyond our own needs and to see the field as a larger whole. And how can we team up with each other, right? Because we ask our kids who come from situations who are, that are much more difficult than the situations we come from in funding, right? I mean, we're talking about child soldiers. We're talking about post-conflict, conflict. conflict and we're asking those kids to come together on a field and cooperate, communicate, trust, share, right? We're asking them to do those things. But how willing are we as practitioners and academics and policymakers to cooperate, communicate, share, and be a part of a team? And so I think that that'll be the challenge for me over the next year is to try to rally the troops, get the team together, the team, and figure out how we can do this to make what everybody is doing in their own cultural context, political context, gender context, and make that relevant to the whole field. And again, I, I think that we are at that point um, where we really can make a difference if we're very intentional about what we're doing and if we actually take what we're talking about to kids and apply it ourselves. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very inspiring. And you sort of put the mountain of challenges in front of us in the field of evaluation, um, including thinking about, and I, both Peter and you sort of brought up this issue, I mean, all of you brought up this issue about sports being a part of a larger peace building whole. And how do we then think about it, both in terms of attribution and evaluation, but think about it in terms of how we implement our programs and design them um, in order to really have those synergies, and because we are, more, in some sense, working towards the same, same goals. Mm -hmm. uh, and so eventually, I'd like you to really talk about that. How can we actually think about that and think about evaluation in a way that doesn't uh, fragment the sport, mm -hmm. uh, but that allows the kinds of um, synergies and cooperation that you were just uh, talking about? Uh, I'm going to actually start and then uh, with one question, just the moderator's uh, prerogative, uh, and then invite everybody to um, whatever questions you have. Uh, because both of you, and as, as a former dialogue practitioner, um, we sort of suffered from the same, you know, add dialogue and stir uh, <laughs> phenomenon. I think we still, we still do. And so I wonder, um, and since both of you, Michael and Peter, mentioned it and you sort of implied it, um, we come with a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, is the issue really that we haven't fully figured out our, uh, we, ha we haven't been clear about our goals and how we're going to get there and really articulate that? Um, is that, would that sort of solve the evaluation problem in some ways, or at least be a good start? <laughs> It would if the goals were really clear, if we could make the goals yeah. really clear. If, 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 uh, if your goal is to reduce the incidence of HIV AIDS, 
you know, that's, that's very clearly measurable. Uh, community re relations are much more difficult to, to measure, and I think we need to uh, probably think in terms of short steps rather than long steps, and smaller goals rather than larger goals, and, and, and see if we can do them. But, uh, but I think what I was trying to say before is that we really do know a lot of stuff, mm. but the projects start without anybody pulling together yeah. this stuff, reading this stuff, uh, attempting to understand uh, what we already know, and they they continue to make the same mistakes. I think you know they, because they don't l learn from each other. From each other and across the different fields. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, can you hear me off this? Okay. Um, I'll take a stab at this. I, I don't. I think that our problems with evaluation on peace building, sports and peace building, is just one of you know, uh, the thousand and one areas of value, you know, pro peace building programming that we don't really know how to evaluate uh, very effectively yet in. Um, I don't think that the solution is just in design and, and figuring out and articulating very clear objectives. Uh, I think that the pro part of the problem is, is that conflict dynamics are extraordinarily complex with million, literally millions of factors that influence what happens in terms of people's relationships and their behaviors vis-a-vis -vis one another and vis-a-vis -vis conflict. And with, you know, um, with $500,000 or a million dollars, we become, in, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a project that's, we have, I think, around a million dollars now in Pakistan. We become, in Pakistan, 180 million person society. We become one voice in the, the very vast choir of voices that are having an influence on people and on young people, for instance, in urban areas, which is where we're targeting. And how can we possibly begin to, even if we have the most clear goal, youth decide that they will not pick up weapons anymore to resolve conflicts. That's pretty clear. That's a nice end impact. Okay, if a young person or a group of young person or the cohort of youth decide not to do it, how can we possibly draw the linkage back to ourselves? Um, it would be absurd. Yesterday I was at a presentation about police reform and there was a gentleman there who is responsible for the training of the Afghan military and police for NATO forces. His budget is 11 billion dollars. 11 billion dollars. The scale at which he's working is massive and you know what he said? He said they're having a hard time figuring out how to actually track the outcomes of their work. <laughs> okay, so we're not alone in that. Um, I wanted to just comment on, just very briefly, I think, that on, on a couple of assumptions that I heard, particularly in your presentation, Dr. Donnelly, that I, I just wanted to challenge. One is that none of us who are working in this area, you know, uh, learn from each other or study. And I, I, I think that um, that all professional worlds have the problem of reinventing the, the, the wheel, or as somebody said in that workshop I was in yesterday, reinventing the flat tire. And um, <laughs> that, sure, that's there. But it's not, it's not blanket, it's not across, you know, uh, almost everybody who works at a high professional level has read and sat with and, you know, John Paul Lederach and, and looked at that particular matrix, the framework that you described around the, the social relationships and how those things work. CDA has put, spent a huge amount of effort uh, pushing all of us to reflect. So I just wanted to challenge that. I think that we have a long ways to go to learn from ourselves. and. Uh, and, but I think more important than learning from ourselves in our own little world, we need to learn from a much broader cross-section of people mm -hmm. and not to ghettoize the peace-building world. We should be learning from dramatists. We should be learning from insurgents and counterinsurgencies. We should be learning from all sorts of different kinds of work that's being done to transform societies. Um, the other thing I wanted to challenge is the assumption of sports being an external thing. Um, because I, I, know, I lived in Argentina briefly when I was 16. And the, you know the guys we used to play soccer every all the time. And when there was no ball, people took whatever <coughs> they could, wrapped up some newspaper and, and tape, and played soccer. It was self-organized, something that we've lost that skill in America to a certain extent in a lot of places. Um, it was self-organized, highly regulated, with a lot of values profound and, and imbued in it. Um, it's not something that in most of the places where we're doing the work, we're looking at where are the current existing the currents of of the use of sport, and how can we tap that? reinforce and elevate it so that it, become, it can become a force for building peace. So why don't we take a couple of questions and answer and then keep going that way. So. Hello again. 
Um, I'm Dodge Fielding, and uh, I manage a program called Score for Peace for the Institute for Multitrack Diplomacy. And I have a comment and follow up with a question. Um, we have heard a lot of wonderful things today in all three panels. Um, and we've heard a lot about output and, and outcomes. But I see that there is a blind spot when it comes to the funnel at the front end in terms of metrics and in terms of what goes into the pro who goes into the programs and and how do you measure the starting point who gets into the programs first of all somebody else asked that question at the last panel about the exclusion of who gets who gets to participate and who does not that seems to me a, a huge challenge and there's there are ways of handling it but the the bottom line is it's very difficult to generate metrics and measure differences in impact and transformation if you don't have the data at the front end. So my, my question to the panel is, in your experience, what, what has been done on the ground so far in that? In those, what's the shape of the front funnel? Uh, my name's Evan Schmidt. Uh, I work for AED, or the Academy for Educational Development. Um, I actually help design sports programs. Um, I worked, have worked with the ECA and the Sports United program, along with the lovely Miss Kelly Davis in the audience, who does a really fantastic job over there, that whole office does. Um, I've also worked directly with embassies. Um, uh, one of our, our biggest water we really is, it's m and &E. it's, it's one of the most difficult things um, that we have to do. <laughs> one of the problems is there's usually very little money for it in the budget. Um, so um, that's always a constant challenge. So, I mean, my question to you, Sarah, you had mentioned kind of putting together, you know, a toolkit or a toolbox, um, you know, that people can kind of go out there and use. What are some of the um, things out there that you think have potential, um, hopefully, you know, uh, in inexpensive tools that are out there that have potential? Um, what would that toolbox look like? Um, and qualitative and also particularly quantitative, which is the, the big, big thing, because as you mentioned yourself, um, the number one thing that funders and that people want to know is, you know, hardcore numbers. You know, if you're going into El Salvador doing a gang prevention program, um, you know, what, what are there less gang members now after that program? You know, they, they want actual matrix that, that show that. So um, that would be my question to the panel or really anyone in the room who, who also has this challenge and who knows of good resources. Sure. Um, as far as the, the toolkit, um, we're hoping that that will emerge, you know, as, as people input their ideas and in, in what is working in certain cultural contexts. Um, I would say something that that is really in, in the conversation now is, and I, I think you ask about this also, this baseline, you know, how do we measure what's happening before and versus outcome uh, post? And that is um, the value of involving locals to do the pre-testing, right? So, and the value of that is, you can train those locals to come in and take part in a one week, two week, one year program. But they're, if they're also involved on the front end as far as the measurement, the baseline, they become even more invested, right? And they're also the ones that are developing those relationships with their local community by getting that front end. And then it removes the outsider coming in asking us these questions. So that takes care of a lot of uh, cultural kind of um, considerations. The other thing about that is, is that it is giving the locals an additional set of skills that they can then transfer into other things, other areas of their life, skills as far as collecting data and those types of things. So as they move on into leadership or as a physical education teacher or whatever, it's helping them develop their skills. And so um, I think that, that was what came to my mind to answer both of you briefly. And what was that? What else did you want to know as far as? Well, I mean, are there any are there any tools out there that currently exist? Any, yes. Anything that you found either has promise that can kind of be built upon um, things that you've used? Yeah, um, there's actually an organization that was really helpful um, to learn about. It's um, Edgework Consulting. Are you familiar with them? Somewhat. Yeah. Okay, so um, some of the ideas that they use as far as quantitative, they say when you go into your programming, you need to be thinking in terms of of getting this information early and often. 
and to use whatever you can, right? So um, even if, if your organization is small and if all you can do is start tracking numbers, right? So these are the participants that come, here's their gender, basic demographic information. Start tracking that, just basics, because that will generate information. Then they talked about more creative uses, so things that the kids can do. One example was um, to use, uh, instead of having the kids fill out a survey, incorporate those surveys into the physical activity. So maybe you have relay races, and then you have a yes-no box, the kid gets a ball, you do a relay race, you ask the kids a question about the program, right? Do you feel um, like you've gotten to know the other, whoever that other is, better as a result of this? Ready, go. So the teams go, they put their ball in a box or a bucket, and then you add those up. So it engages the kids in answering those questions. It incorporates physical activity. And then you have some quantitative data that's very inexpensive. You know, how hard is it to count the balls and tally it up? And then depending upon how large your program is, then obviously that would evolve. Um, some of the other methods are, are also very creative and I, I think would be interesting and and correlate a lot with what you're doing, and that is the idea of kids creating their own newspapers or their own news kind of reports. So they're interviewing one another, their counterparts that are also taking part in these sport programmings, and then you hang these up on the wall, right? So that's qualitative, but then what happens, as we know as researchers, you have qualitative data, so you need to thematize that. So you've got 100 or 80 newspapers hanging on the wall, you go through and the theme becomes, my coach had a big impact on me. Well, now that becomes quantitative data that's very valuable, but the kids input it, and it's not the, the formal, you set up the video camera in front of the kid's face and ask him questions or her questions. So Edgework has some great tools, that I, and they are very interested in this conversation of specifically, they deal a lot with sport for development, but also sport for peace. So that may be a great resource just for all of us to tap into. Here, Michael. The one either in the first or second question. I, I was just, um, for, I just wanted to respond to the first one. I think that the design phase, there, there's a couple of really key things. One is, what are you trying to achieve? So that's back to, to, to Diana's question at the beginning. Um, and I think that uh, one of the keys to any kind of peace building initiative, whether it's a peace building initiative, or, I mean sports or, or, or other form, is to making a decision about what strategic intervention we're trying to achieve. What is that specific change? Recognize that we're not going to change the whole world with you know, with a game, or with a television show, or with a whatever it is that you're doing, um, and recognize that you can carry you know one or two specific changes. The challenge that I find is that um, the creation of indicators. We, we like the word metrics these days. The, the the challenge of of creating indicators that are really indicative. You know, we have this smart, right, specific, measurable, achievable, blah blah blah, but what it misses is the indicative, right? The challenge of creating indicative indicators that really are rooted in the shifts that are going on and people's own perceptions of things, it takes a lot of experience on the ground to do it. And the, the example that I like to give is I lived in Phnom Penh for a little bit and there was a, a violent incident with a small um, sort of ragtag armed group attacked Phnom Penh. A bunch of people got killed and the city went under curfew and people were nervous and I was, I was young and just starting, I was nervous. and. Um, this friend of mine said, oh, no, 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 things are fine. I said, well, how do you know? He said, the gold cellars opened in the next morning. Ah, so the gold cellars open is an indication of uh, security. Now, the problem with that is that that's hard then to sell to, you know, an indicator like that is profoundly rooted. It's hard to sell, right, to your donor. You, it's hard to tell that story of your initiative around security that resulted in X number of days that the gold sellers were actually open versus closed and a change in that. So I think that, that there's this balance that has to that we have to develop in our in our work of sort of engaging and trying and doing some things and seeing what happens and allowing some open uh, openness to the unexpected and trust in listening to people to find out what is it that's changing and what how is it that they know that those things are changing. And then over time, with any given initiative, you can start to generate indicators. You can start to then turn them from qualitative ones into quantitative ones. So you start hearing, hey, people watch this show, or people participate in this, 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 uh, this sports project. And then they started creating their own sports projects mm -hmm. in their communities. And you start hearing that, and we never thought they would do their own sports project. So maybe that turns into an indicator. So it's cyclical, you know? And if you're good, then you can turn that cycle into a scalable thing, right? And start to look at it 
broader and broader and use the information you're getting to garner more resources to do it at the next level. The, the complexity of this is, is enormous and, and I think we've had some really good ideas about evaluation here, but um, I, I keep being reminded of a <coughs> quote from uh, from a friend of mine, Gary Armstrong, who did some peace building, uh, reintegration work in Liberia. Um, and, and he said, you know, that you can have all of these things, you know, these uh, indicators and, um, and uh, building local capacity and those kinds of things. But he said, if you, if you leave the structural situation in the country the same as you found it in terms of disadvantage and disaffection and and uh, and you know that that situation hasn't improved, then it's going to revert quite quickly without without making those structural changes. And that's where I think that the the sport and peace projects need to work quite closely with governments and and other projects to 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 change the structural circumstances in the countries. My name is David Santafante. Uh, my question is, if you come across research or you use research um, based on projects that focus on inner cities that often experience the same kind of conflict that you would experience uh, abroad. So if we've taken a look inwardly, um, and that's more at a micro level, and also at the macro level where uh, large communities come together uh, based on sports teams. You mentioned the New Orleans Saints. That was big after Katrina. Uh, Virginia Tech is another example, and uh, as mm. is Marshall. And I was wondering if you looked at those kinds of comparisons. <laughs> um, as far as inner city work, that is definitely a place that we're beginning to look. And I don't know why it took us so long to look there, but they are also struggling with the, the same questions. How do we measure and evaluate what's taking place in our inner city sports programs as far as reducing gang violence and all of that? So they have somewhat a handle on program specific quantitative type surveys, but um, in, in all of the conferences that I'm attending and, and the conversations that are taking place, they are asking us for our expertise and think somehow we have it together and we're saying, wait a minute, you all are doing this. We want your expertise. And so it's great that those conversations have started while none of us really have a great, great handle and have perfected this yet, so. Yeah, certainly in, in North America, my students are beginning to be interested in, in two particular things. One is, uh, is work on native reservations and the other is inner city work. And uh, there really isn't very much. I mean, there are good critiques of midnight basketball and that kind of program, you know, as being kind of social controlling, social order type programs, but uh, but um, I haven't seen any, any good research yet. Harvard, Harvard prevents research center, they did a study in Boston called Tribe Called Boston, which is where it wasn't necessarily Kentucky, they did access and kind of in comparative stuff globally. Are you a student? No. Okay. What well, in, in terms of in terms of the the <laughs> just, just throwing it out there. No. Um, <laughs> the, I just want to comment in terms of the you know the this the issue of sort of the major events. Um, you know, I think this has come up uh, again and again today, and um, I think it's one that will warrant would warrant quite a lot more study. Um, what does you know a team you know Saints marching to the to the Super Bowl or people talked about the Yankees in 2001 after 9-11 or you know what does the World Cup mean in South Africa and you know we try to measure the effect of you know um, these mega sporting events you know the World Cup in terms of an economic and quantifiable metrics I happened to go to South Africa I was very lucky um, and I, I stood uh, the day before the quarterfinal in Cape Town between uh, Argentina and Germany I went to um, Robben Island and one of the little sto less known stories about Robben Island is about a uh, football association called the Makani Football Association, which was where a group of prisoners, political prisoners, not the elite ones, not Mandela and his and his uh, cell block, uh, but the more the the lower level in the political ranks, uh, lobbied for years to get permission to form a football association. And football was perceived there in South Africa as a black sport. It was popular mostly among blacks. And it was, um, 
but finally had the, the got the right to, to organize this. Um, there's a wonderful book about it called Much More Than a Game. One of the cool things is how they had a, a copy of the FIFA rules and they used it to teach themselves, the prisoners, rule of law, democratic processes, elections, all sorts of processes that then played out. One of the, the people involved in it became the um, basically the deputy uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court. Um, to stand there on that ground and then the next day to be on a train into Cape Town where blacks and whites and coloreds rode together wearing you know uniforms of soccer teams including Bafana Bafana you know to celebrate en masse the world tournament in their continent in their continent and in their country was a triumph it was a moment of triumph right and I think that it would be a very worthwhile study because I think that for me that's that's why we use sports is because of its symbolic power right that's why I think that it warrants a conference like this and other things what is it that a moment like the New Orleans Saints gives to a city or a World Cup you know in South Africa gives to a country or Iraq winning the Asia Cup mm -hmm. you know where Kurds and Shia and Sunni play together what does it do for a place what does it do to people's consciousness how do we actually then take our work, whether we're working with a few thousand dollars and, and 20 kids or, you know, millions of dollars and, and more kids, how do we turn our small micro event, you know, our key people's thing into something that becomes part of national mythology? Hi, my name is Amy Watts, and I'm here because I work with Pax Christi USA. And my question, I wanted to follow up on something that you mentioned, Peter, kind of um, a discourse analysis question when you raised the issue of oftentimes in, in sports, you know, we use language that, you know, we would all characterize as violent language or war-making language. And so I wanted to follow up on that if anyone has a comment about how that's been addressed in programs or if you think that is being addressed in sports and peace building programs and then also ideas about masculinity in sports and if mm -hmm. you think that that's also being addressed in programs like this. Thanks. I'm not masculine. <laughs> <laughs> slowly. It's being addressed slowly um, and that's where we we're developing good practices and we see, you know, the, the, uh, the kind of experimentation that is going on in, in the different projects. And, and certainly there are a couple of projects that I know about who've tried to change uh, some of the terminology of sport. Um, and uh, gender inclusion has, has been very much a part of some other projects. Um, you know, the, the significance of women uh, in peace building has, has been recognized, but you know, as as I mentioned, I think it, it, it has to be done carefully and with with local consultation. Uh, but um, but I think those things are slowly beginning to happen. I'll, I'll take it. You know, when we started this project, the team, one of the major criticisms that that was actually generated internally uh, from CERT, uh, and I'm sure externally too, but was you know, soccer is popular with men really and so you're making a television drama and soap opera that it's going to be watched by men so this was a great challenge to us and so one of the things that started we, we realized very quickly is that there's no need at all if we're going to make a show that has to be about a men's team not at all and uh, so we made in Kenya the show is about a co-ed team and uh, the woman is the there's a woman who's a captain you know and the dynamics and the challenges that emerge around that particular um, that particular relationship of a woman leader in a co-ed group, you know, is it creates a space for us to grapple with all sorts of issues of women as peace builders. In the DRC, the show is entirely about a women's show. It's entirely a third, you know, somebody was talking about 1325. It's entirely about women's place at the table in, in the peace process there and in building peace. And they deal we deal with all sorts of issues around women in, in the conflict, including gender-based violence and rule of law and access to justice, which are all, you know, things that we're hearing a lot about in the news recently, but are long-standing challenges in, in the Congo. So uh, one of the things we found is that if we, by using the paradigm of sports, which is traditionally, especially soccer, is traditionally perceived uh, in most of the world as being a men's world, uh, you can penetrate that very deeply uh, and really break, break, uh, break stereotypes and break 
um, and, and create iconic, iconic images, actually, that crack open stereotypes and create space. Hmm. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to follow up on, on something I've, we st I think I heard in the last panels, but um, Peter, you're sort of starting to enumerate some of the lessons that you've been collecting about how, how are good programs run around training of volunteers, around local context and local consultation. And I just, and we heard that in the last panel as well. And I just wonder, I mean, we, we seem to be still struggling with issues around how do you deal with attribution and how do you deal with in the larger context? How do you deal with measuring the whole transference issues? How do you deal with a lot of these? But I wonder if we're ready, are we ready to establish, I mean, is there enough knowledge out there to say, here's some criteria against which um, sports for peace you know, peace building programs can be measured um, around just even around how they're organized and conducted. You know, we know we know that if they're more consistent, um, they'll have better impact. We know if they're more locally rooted, they'll have better impact. If the volunteers are well trained, and you can start developing some criteria, um, even now to start saying, okay, we can at least start there, even if we can't deal with some of these larger issues. Yeah, I th I think we are, we are there. We need to uh, to start uh, disseminating these kinds of ideas and, and to continue learning from, from, from the programs that are in place. And I think we tend to, the rest of the world tends to have a much broader um, definition of sport than, than in uh, the United States. And, and they would include very often folk games and dance and, uh, and mm -hmm. physical activities of various kinds uh, within a, a Sport for Peace project. And, and I think that uh, that needs to be understood as well. Uh, it's not just competitive sports. And, and sometimes those other activities work much better than, than sport to, uh, uh, to, to, to help with the project. Mm -hmm. Great. I just want to make a couple of quick questions. I think one, one of the best practices could also be when is sports not appropriate? It goes back to, you know, yeah. that sports is just a tool. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to assume that it's always the right tool for the context. And then just um, one other comment and a question. So one also a potential research yeah. agenda is also looking at kind of conflict prevention, early warning, which I've never seen. But how can you measure what's happening in the sports arena as a tool for showing how conflict is increasing in terms of, you know, the discourse that people are using in stadiums, levels of violence, you know, the antagonism between teams would be, yeah, it would be interesting. And the, the other question is, in terms of donors, which donors get it? So, I mean, there's a lot of donors who are funding something related to peace building, the intersection of sports and peace building narrow. But are there donors that you would say are really buying into this, understanding it, and have a vision for the long term and are going to be around for 10 or 20 years doing this? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm surprised there's really, I mean, there's some kind of partial donors here. I mean, and obviously USIP is one, but it seems like we keep it's talking nice. about donors, so they're, that seems to be something that's needed more to be present in these things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start off on, on the first one, when is sport not appropriate? Um, Andrea Selius from Norway has probably done the most comprehensive look at this, and, and, and uh, he suggests that you need political stability post-conflict in, or, in order for, to even hope to have a chance of, uh, of having some success with the programs. I think uh, mm -hmm. probably the, pro the projects in Israel have, um, as, as far as I know, have generally been unsuccessful. And in fact, uh, one of the, the better projects um, uh, was just about to start its fifth year. The volunteers were all ready to go for the summer, and uh, and the, the last conflict with Lebanon broke out, and and everything got shut down. You know, so uh, you know when when things are still that that politically tense, and and you know, and violence still has the potential to break out. Uh, the, it's not a good time to bring sport in, in, into the situation, I think, it, and, and political stability really is needed. I'll, 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 I'll take a shot at a couple of these things. One is that I, I, I'm trying to remember where this was. I think it must have been in The Economist, either in The Economist or Time around the World Cup, about the link between economic growth and performance of national football associations. Um, and the, the exception, that the glaring exception they pulled out, they said if you pull Brazil out because Brazil is just good no matter what happens um, there, that you can actually see a, a direct correlation between numbers of times you qualify, you know, countries qualify, and Argentina actually as well, 
but qualifications for the World Cup and economic growth. Um, so I think that, that that it usually is about the whole institutional structure that's behind sport um, and the organizational uh, structures that are at place and the polit politics in it. Um, in terms of the selection of the tool, again, I, one of the things that keeps striking me in this conversation is how many of these co things are cut across, including our, our practices, our good, good and bad practices, which cut across uh, the tool. You know, so if you're using, you know, whether you're using track two diplomacy efforts at the highest level, or you're, you know, using uh, youth leadership development for peace building or television or whatever it is, it strikes me that some of our same questions are at play. Um, I think that that is something that has to be measured very locally. There, I don't think in that particular thing. What tool do we use at what time? Uh, it's going to be pretty different from Yemen to Zimbabwe, isn't it? Uh, what's going to be appropriate, what's going to fit, what's going to work. It has to do with what uh, existing cultural trends there are, what kind of organizations there are on the ground who thought of different things, what kind of exposure people have had, you know. And I think that part of the, what's really important for us to pull out is actually the practice of getting at that question, the answer to that, which is about being locally rooted and being as grounded as possible and listening as deeply as possible to people from all sides of conflict uh, from all stratas of society to what's needed and what would work and what wouldn't work. Uh, people's wisdom often, you know, often is very helpful, obviously, in guiding us in making good decisions about what we can do and what we can't. Well, thank you for thank you. lots of great food for thought. Um, I'd just like to just bring out three things that hopefully as we go into Ted summarizing uh, and uh, getting some input on what an agenda for USIP going forward, an agenda for the field going forward. Uh, it seems out of this conversation, first thing, we know a lot, and it's worth actually cataloging that and turning that from an evaluation perspective into some criteria that could actually be useful to people. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, and you're starting to do that, Peter's doing that, um, and really kind of doing, doing that seems helpful. Uh, Give me a pound. <laughs> now you need to spread it to areas that aren't doing sport too. Um, but and that and that the challenges are challenges that are, are being faced in other areas of peace building. And so in this sense, evaluation of sport and peace building is not very different than all the other areas of peace building around how do you measure attitude change? How do you measure some of these outcomes? How do you deal with the attribution question when there are lots of other influences? Um, is the attribution question I mean all those questions are questions that are being asked by everybody. So I guess you're, you're saying we should really be learning from other areas um, and bringing some of that learning in and not reinventing the flat tire, I love that expression, uh, is a great, um, is a great uh, question. Uh, but I, I think it, ending on that is the importance of actually connecting to the larger context, and several of you mentioned that, um, both connecting to the larger context and also make sure that it's grounded and local. Um, connecting to the larger context both in terms of you know, what happens to the transference when you go back to an environment in which there are challenges and where, where there's some hostility and people mention the political challenges uh, of doing that and also the fact that sport isn't going to do everything so it needs to be part of a larger strategy and can we then think about how to incorporate that into how we assess it so not overload not overload it um, but also sort of hold people accountable to sort of putting themselves into a larger context and strategizing a little beyond their own, uh, their own projects uh, in that sense. Uh, but also at the same time thinking and evaluation, local people, I mean, they know what the indicators of when things are, what some of the indicators are. They know better than anybody. Um, and so really including um, local participants in development of the processes, development of the indicators, measurement, um, may give come back into the indicative indicative part of the indicators and the evaluation um, can give you some much more accurate information and those those things seem to have come out in ways that didn't come up before so thank you thank you uh, I will turn it over to Ted thank you if you'd like to stay that would be fine with me since I'd like to put you to work as well so please. <laughs> We have a half hour left, and I'd like to do two things. First, I'd like to provide an additional summary to what Diana gave you and what she thought were very useful ideas for further work, things for all of us to think about. And then I'd like to turn it over to you and to get your input in what you think 
we should be thinking about, we people in the field and we here at USIP. Now, as I listened, and I speak as a outsider in this world, the first thing I heard this morning is thinking about bridging the gaps between the macro and the micro. Is there any relationship to mega events that happen? If you want a moment in time, a moment in history, which very often seems to evaporate, and, but sometimes doesn't, and what happens at the micro level that people do. Diana talked about thinking about a strategy, including lots of discrete pieces. Maybe there is something to think about in the area between the macro and the micro. Someone referred to it as the, I think it's the meso, something in between. If there is something between, however, it's worth thinking about. A number of people talked about the support frameworks for whatever you do. Is it the parents? Is it the community? Can any sport and peace building program at a local level really get much traction if it runs without factoring in or bringing in parents or whatever is the broader community. Unless it affects them and they're brought into it, can it have any longer term impact? And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the arrows where the sports effort was going, who it was actually trying to achieve. Was it trying to achieve the children, the youth, in order to influence the parents in the wider community, or both at the same time, or the whole community, uh, with the pinpoint being the, the youth, the children? And once I started thinking it through, it got very murky to me. And I was trying to think, what actually are you trying to do? Because if you're only working with the children, how far are you going to get? Three, the whole issue of sustainability. What I was just saying takes you to sustainability. Where is this going to get you? Where is it taking you? Short, mid, longer term. How do you do it? Uh, Brendan Tui talked about long-term long tracking. Uh, what can his research, his data, tell us about sustainability. Is it, a, is it real or is it an illusion? Is it, that, is it the holy grail we're all t talking about, but never <coughs> seems to happen? Some people also talked about the next generation. What is the research that needs to be done now to serve as the building blocks for the next stage? What is the preparation that needs to be made in having another generation ready to take on this work? They're interesting questions. Uh, is that a role for the academic world, uh, for others to add? All very interesting. Some people talked about the target. Now, target is all in the eye of the beholder. If you want to work on the elite, if you want to work on the youth, you want to work on the child soldier, you want to work on the grassroots. Well, the conventional wisdom and the good wisdom is, well, the target depends <laughs> upon your goal. But already we have so many goals, so many targets. What's the right one? Is there a right one? Dr. Donnelly talked about linking sport closer to theory. I think this is something that came out more and more as everyone talked. A lot of these questions are not new. They're basic theoretical and practical issues that should come into play whenever you're talking about any aspect of peace building. And I think that's a good point for all of us to remember, that in fact we're not only talking about sport and peace building. We're talking about peace building using a particular type of tool, a particular vehicle to take us and the people we're working with somewhere.
training for those who are going to work in this field? Fascinating question. How much training? What sort of training? How much is enough? Uh, I leave it to those who work in the field. But all very, very good questions. There are some prescriptive uh, ideas. Bring all who are involved in this field, practitioners, academics, people who hope to use the product of these efforts together to think about measurement and evaluation, despite the competition for resources, to see if people actually can work together to build this field. And then we got into the question that maybe it's not just design, maybe it's complexity, maybe this is too complex, and we seem to bounce back and forth about whether this is something we could get a handle on with theory, or maybe it was too complex and not so easy. I'll leave that out there as a question for others to think about. And in the final analysis, we think about sport as a tool, how far you can go with it and what are its limitations. How far can you go if the key variables remain unchanged? Can you really have much change in a society if the key variables are not changing, that you're just picking away at this piece? Or is there some way you can pick away at the key variables which seem to be unchanging? Now I want to leave it up to you. I said a lot of things which seem to make sense to me based <laughs> upon my very limited knowledge of the field. But to those of you who follow it, what do you think about it? What do you feel about the day? What did it make you think about? Please. I'll also call upon my panelists. Thanks for asking a whole bunch of unanswerable questions. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think you've just raised some key points for consideration. Uh, you and our session uh, uh, chair um, have both uh, raised some really important issues, and it's certainly uh, uh, a good uh, it's good message message for academics to take back and mm -hmm. to and, and the recognition. I mean, there's so little research in this area that uh, that uh, and, and it's relatively new area. So we certainly need to go back and encourage our grad students to uh, mm -hmm. continue working on this and do it ourselves. Yeah, I, I would agree. Actually, um, I'm an adjunct professor right now at the University of Tennessee, and I've designed a course. Um, I just called it this because it sounded good, but service learning, sport and community development. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> so it's in our kinesiology, recreation, and sports studies department, and we're actually working with our undergraduate students using sport as a tool to reach out to the local Iraqi refugee population. Um, surprisingly, Knoxville is home to 120 plus and rapidly growing Iraqi families um, who are coming to the States with, with refugee status. One of the things that we talked about in the kinesiology department is, and especially among our sport management majors for undergrads and grad students, is their frustration with the field of sport management, um, not as much kinesiology, but especially in, in sport management, that the things we talk about are big business, right? It's just big sport, it's the mega events. And so their educational experiences are really <coughs> rooted in and geared towards this big for profit. And what students are frustrated with is a lot of them see and want more information and academic training and research and exposure to sport for advocacy, positive social change, and those types of things. And so as a response to those students' needs, I designed this course, and so they are using uh, recreation, social activities, uh, conflict resolution, inclusion kind of stuff to welcome these families, these Iraqi families, into the Knoxville community, which is a real <laughs> transition to come from Baghdad to Knoxville, Tennessee. That would be, I mean, I would probably have to take you all through some therapy as well if you came. Um, 
but I say all that to say that that among students there is a real desire for information and academic training for this nonprofit sport for positive social change world. And I think that that's a, a resource that as practitioners we're not tapping into, right? So I can imagine a service learning course where students go out and do local community building, peace building through sport, right? So they get the local context, they get a handle on it. And then they go for an international experience but we're sending them out and then, then as grad students, we send them out to sort of help us as practitioners in the field to carry out some of this research that we don't have the money for, we don't have the time for, and then our students are adding to this body of knowledge. Um, but, but I think our students are, are a group of people that we're not really utilizing and there's a real interest in this area and I'm sure several of you could attest to that, like maybe you three. Yeah. <laughs> The only thing is to put it with my academic hat um, on, and I, I come back to your pulling the different people together. Um, and I, I teach negotiation and conflict resolution. There's a humanitarian set of studies. Um, there's sports and nutrition and you know, we, public health, and we're all dealing with these subjects and rarely actually come together and pool our knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's some opportunity um, in this field, and then coming back to Peter's question around, you know, can we connect the sport to the theory, practice to the theory around peace building, um, that we're not <coughs> both in the academic institutions, but we can do it in some of the practitioner institutions, really bringing some of these folks together. Michael. So uh, my, 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 my hat is totally different. It's a pure practitioner's hat. I found myself this today reflecting on, you know, what are the 101 ways that we can use sport that have been invented and what are the 101 ways that haven't been invented yet? And um, the, I, I think that one of the, the coolest things about sport is that it's one of the few tools that we do have in peace building that crosses the, the layers of society, you know, that we can, you can do sports and peace building that engages, you know, the, the absolute most elite powerful decision makers of a society and you can do youth uh, peace building initiatives in the most remote you know communities that have no electricity or whatever and there's not very many other tools that we have that quite give us that that multi-layer element to peace building which um, at least in my organization we've identified as crucial to, to success uh, we're looking at good practices you know forget best practice none of us have invented those yet <coughs> We're looking at good practices, and that's one of them. Work at multiple layers simultaneously. Sports is one of those few spaces. Um, I think that's really cool. And um, I think that one of the other things, though, that, that uh, has been going through my mind in here is that with the exception of the US Olympic Committee, we don't have any of the major leagues of sports in this room here. And they're the ones who shape this more profoundly than and with all due respect to all of us peace builders, we're still an easy weensy little tiny field, you know, uh, compared to the vast world out there. Um, whereas, you know, the commissioners, you know, the set bladders and David Stern to the world are, you know, are massively influential people whose actions on a daily basis transform people's narratives. And so I wonder how we engage them. How do we actually help people who are influencing truly the fabric of our society globally and nationally, how do we ha have them, how do we help them to draw on what we know and what we want to achieve? That is the, to me that's the, somebody at the very beginning talked about scale, you know how we achieve changes at scale, that's I think maybe where, where in the sports world we can get. So from the bottom to the top top and everywhere in between and that scale, that's where it's been going through my mind. Thank you. Would. Someone else, please. Uh, hi, Anna Raguz, a uh, graduate student at George Mason University. Um, following up on a previous question, and as well as something that Mr. Um, Schipler said earlier, on um, the symbolism that sports has and in the um, presentation that you were showing, um, in the literature that I've read, there's been a lot of criticism with sports being seen as purely symbolic and not producing enough changes in society or in the culture um, which could potentially be one of the reasons why um, there's lack of literature in the field. Um, so how, how do we move away from that? I know sports, we've talked about it as being part of a larger peace building project, but is there something lacking in sports um, that needs to be changed 
or like for example when um uh south africa um won the rugby champion or rugby world cup in 95 there's a huge momentum that the country was going to transform and that didn't really happen so how do we keep that momentum in those types of events going so that it's not purely a symbolic event that's just going to be stuck in the past and not produce any um concrete and sustainable um, changes in society. I, I think that's a terrific question because that connects the, the micro and the macro in, in important ways. I think the symbolic importance of sport has been probably overstated. It's a, it's a short-term feel-good uh, moment. Um, it doesn't change uh, if you host an Olympics or a World Cup. It doesn't change your country's uh, position on the United Nations Human Development Index one iota, uh, and it might even reduce it if you spend too much money on it, uh, which countries tend to do. But that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a connection and there can't be a connection. And I think that uh, if, uh, if um, major um, multi-sport or single sport organizations were, were to act more responsibly, they would work with, with Hosts of major events to uh, to to ensure that there was uh, w uh, widespread changes uh, along the lines determined by the by the country involved um, as a result of the uh, the build up to and the legacy from uh, from hosting those major events and I think that needs a lot of planning. Um, I think uh, countries get caught up in just the business of of hosting. They make all kinds of promises in order to get the event, and then those promises get forgotten really quickly. And I think that uh, that, that needs to be engaged with on a continuing basis. I just I, I think that the the thing about sports and society is that they're they're like a, a theater for us to deal with our problems. But, you know, if you think about it, what is it about? It's about abandoning yourself emotionally, totally, to something that actually doesn't matter at all, really. I mean, I you know I'll I'll watch the Redskins game and you know curse the television usually, and <laughs> you know but then the game ends and I'm back with you know in my regular life. There's this national conversation going on in the NFL about these hits to the head. There's nothing new about this. People have been getting concussions and hits to the head for a long time in football. Why is that happening now? What is that actually reflecting about our society? that's manifesting in this kind of conversation. What is it like, what are they doing for us? And I think that for me, the answer to that question is how we then, the rest of us, use it to have a conversation about violence, for instance, <coughs> about hurt, about pain, about competition, about what, you know, all those things. The other one is the baseball steroids thing. If you notice, the baseball steroids bust happened just about a year before the housing bust. We were an economy on steroids with a lot of false wealth. And baseball was, you know, with a lot of false muscles. And I think that, that you know, you could see baseball has always sort of been just ahead of the curve, you know, um, <laughs> in our society from Jackie Robinson to the housing bus. I went to visit Hiroshima. And, you know, in, in Hiroshima, the community there built, rebuilt very quickly after the dropping of the atomic bomb. And... Um, almost about 150 yards from where the bomb actually exploded, uh, the community built a baseball stadium. And they worked, it was a, like a communal event. It was something that everybody put in, all different local businesses and such, did to put, to build this baseball stadium, okay? And it was built in 1954, nine years later, right there at that spot. Then their team was a perennial loser. So they found an American manager, and they bought an American manager to coach, uh, to manage the team, and they won the championship. The symbolic power of that, and that story was told to me when I went to Hiroshima, and I went to that stadium. The power of that for a community is very, is, is quite important, so. We have one uh, speaker who's very patient. Oh, can I, can I just follow up on that okay. for one second? I, I, I gave uh, a lecture the other day on um, masculinity, violence, and injury in, in sports, and, and I showed students a clip uh, where, of a video where uh, the, news, the news clip said that uh, concussion was the sport injury of the 1990s. <sighs> So, so you know, we've been conscious of that for quite some time, and, and I, I really am pleased that it's on the agenda again, but, uh, you know, I hope it doesn't go away this time as well. Please. 
Yeah, that in some ways that's was I guess one of the call to actions that I would have is to really look at um, peace building within sport. I know we've talked about through sport and sport as a tool for peace building, but I'd also encourage us to really think about peace and dignity, you know, within the culture of sport because we have to think about the status quo and the way that we're really talking about a transformative effort within sport, I mean, particularly when it comes to discrimination and, and uh, exclusion within the context of sport, you know, whether it's gender or disability or you know, race or religion. Um, so I think all, all, the, all the forms of discrimination that does take place is a form of, you know, non, you know, uh, non-peace building, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I think if, if we, I think that's an important, I know we've spent a lot of today's discussion talking about peace through sport, but I still think there's an essential role of, a, uh, of all of us to really think about peace within sport. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A last comment? Please. I seem to be the bad penny here. I keep turning up. <clears throat> um, this has been really very, very exciting and very productive. And um, I'm going home with a huge smile on my face and a frown on my, on my forehead, I mean a furrow on my forehead, because there's so much to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very, very much. And thank you uh, for hosting this fantastic, wonderful um, workshop. This has been great. My comment is, I believe that we're at the 100th monkey stage with professional sports on the global scale. <clears throat> I was thinking uh, earlier there was a, a representative from UNESCO here. And um, FC Barcelona, which is one of the richest uh, soccer clubs in the world, <clears throat> for the last three years has essentially put aside uh, a loss. Uh, they've, they've, excuse me, they've absorbed a loss of $40 million a year just to put the word UNESCO on their on their shirts and and the other soccer clubs have have actually followed through with that the hundredth mon monkey syndrome is i think there are more and more professional clubs many of which have more money than god i mean real madrid's uh, annual budgets pushing 600 million dollars a year 600 million dollars that's one club um, i think what's happening is that more and more there's a social responsibility to the, to the country and to the fans. And, and we are, I believe, th this community, at the stage of helping that 100th monkey to get it. Because if the top 25 clubs in Europe, for instance, or the world, were to put together a fund and they put in 3% of their annual budget I think we would have a lot of programs that would be sustainable for 10 or 15 years or, th or, or 20, and it would be a branding boon for those clubs. And I personally am devoted to seeing, to making that happen mm -hmm. with, with Score for Peace. I'm, I'm personally, we are, my organization is approaching AC Milan and, and other clubs like that to make that happen. And there is, in fact, a, <clears throat> a group in Liechtenstein, of all places, that is devoted to being the traffic cop for funds from clubs for the betterment of humanity. Mm -hmm. So that's my comment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much again. And I think we should all give you a huge hand. Please. Um, mine is a question um, from within the framework of peace peace building and its uh, partnership with development. Development as an industry has been what, around for what, about 60 years or so, and peace building as an industry, uh, so much younger as a, as a field, and so much um, we're in partnership with development. And I don't think there's a place that I've seen this more evident than in the world of sport and what we're doing with sport. And so many people talk about sport and peace building, and I think they're actually using development paradigms. And some people talk about it. The whole world of peace building is kind of confusing it for me. Um, so it, it seems natural that there's a lot of, uh, there's some questions and some lack of clarity. So my question is, do we see in the next decade coming uh, the ability of the fields of development 
and peace building, able to find ways to be uh, mutually supportive, but it, we're able to distinguish what we're doing. Are we, are we doing some development? Are we doing peace building? Are they um, commingled? Are we able to, to really be able to, to distinguish what we're about? And is actually the world of sport in engaging with the rest of the world a place where this could, uh, we could see some leadership and some beginnings in that? Just a question and kind of a hope. Thank you. Anybody want to touch it? I'll, t I'll touch that one a little, only a little bit. Because uh, um, I, I, I see a commingling over the years, having come from peace building and gone into development and sort of in the sitting in the middle in general confusion as you are. Um, and I think it comes back to having some clarity about what we're doing um, and why we're doing it. Uh, and my experience, particularly around evaluation in peace building, um, but also in development, we make these huge leaps of faith. You know, we do something and then we say, well, we're going to bring tolerance, we're going to bring reconciliation. And some much more rigorous thinking will at least help us then think about um, both how do we sort of how do we work the two and integrate the two, um, but how do we also differentiate at the same time so that we know what we're doing. Um, so I think a little bit of clarity around that um, would be helpful. I guess it's time. First of all, I'd like to thank our panelists for very nice. I'd also like to thank the woman who helped us organize this. Yeah. Mr. Thank you. And please feel free if, when you think about the event, you have additional ideas, additional thoughts, you can always reach us here at USIP. You can reach Ted Pfeiffer, Suleiman Sabu Ali. We'd be interested in your thoughts and any additional ideas you have for follow-up work. Thank you very much. And there's evaluations outside. Please.